It was New Year's Eve, December the 31st, 192 AD. Commodus started the day as Roman Emperor, but he fell to an assassination plot orchestrated by his mistress Marcia. First, she tried poisoning him, but because he was already drunk, Commodus quickly fell ill and vomited the toxin before it could take effect. Then Marcia resorted to less subtle methods as she simply sent a wrestler into the Emperor's chambers to strangle him. Commodus was dead, and so with him was the Nerva Antoni dynasty, as he had no children of his own and never adopted any heirs. The question now was, who would become the new emperor? This would not be an easy thing to answer. In fact, the collapse of the Nerva Antonine dynasty plunged the Roman Empire into the most turbulent period of its history so far. In 193 AD, five men would vie for power, and in one way or another, each one of them would lay claim to the Roman throne. Eventually, after betrayals, conspiracies, and assassinations, only one would emerge triumphant, ready to forge his own dynasty, following the chaos known as the Year of the Five Emperors. By the time Commodus had perished, he had made sworn enemies out of the Roman Senate. Therefore, they immediately went to work, undoing many of the changes he had brought on, and even had him declared a public enemy of Rome. They realized that news of his demise would create chaos, so they kept his death a secret until they already had someone lined up to follow him as emperor. That someone was Pertinax. According to the Historia Augusta and Cassius Dio, Pertinax was born in Alba Pompeia in 126 AD. He did not come from a noble family, as his father, Helvius Successus, was a free man, meaning a former slave who had gained his freedom. Pertinax received only a modest education and originally intended to become a teacher, but found that military life was more to his liking. With the help of a family friend who was a former consul, he obtained a position as a cohort prefect in Syria. As the years went by, Pertinax steadily rose through the ranks, especially after distinguishing himself in the Parthian War during the reigns of Antonius Pius and Marcus Aurelius. Pertinax spent decades in the military, moving from Syria to Britain, then Moesia, to Dacia. He became a trusted aide of Claudius Pompeianus, one of the most important commanders under Marcus Aurelius, and for his efforts, he was granted several governorships and a consulship before being finally assigned to the Senate. And when Commodus was dead, two men who had been involved in his assassination, Electus and Laetus, concluded that Pertinax had the rank, the experience, and the popularity to become the new emperor. When he was told of this, Pertinax first sent a companion to see the body of the former emperor. Indeed, the reign of Commodus had made a lot of men paranoid, and they feared that something like this could be a test that might end in their execution. After he was convinced of the truth, Pertinax went to the Praetorian barracks to get them on his side. Basically, he told them that Commodus died of natural causes and promised them a money gift called a donativum so they would support his ascension to the throne. Finally, he went to the Senate where he stated his case but also offered to step down if someone younger and less feeble than him was more suitable for the job. Apparently, it was this modesty and practicality that convinced the Senate that Pertinax was the best candidate, so on January the 1st, 193 AD, he was crowned the new Roman Emperor. The people of Rome seemed pleased at this development as they chanted the name Pertinax and slung insults at Commodus. Then angry mob also demanded the former emperor's body so they could drag it through the streets and tear it to pieces, but as it had already been interred, they had to settle for smashing up the statues of Commodus. By all accounts, Pertinax tried to be a good ruler. Cassius Dio said that he showed humaneness and integrity and careful consideration for the public welfare. He also wanted a more democratic reign, so he refused fancy, complicated titles, and instead styled himself as chief of the Senate, a very old position from before the days of the empire. Unsurprisingly, Pertinax continued reversing many of the policies instituted by Commodus and was more in line with Marcus Aurelius. And, of course, well, this got him killed. It won't surprise you to learn that Pertinax did not have a long reign. After all, we're going to go through five of them in a single year. His biggest mistake was angering the Praetorian Guard. Technically, they were meant to be an elite unit of Rome's greatest soldiers who acted as bodyguards and intelligence officers for the emperor. In reality, though, they were one of the empire's most corrupt institutions, and as the de facto armed forces inside the city of Rome, they knew that their support was important for an emperor and regularly bargained their position into obtaining more money, power, and privilege. 
soldiers. It was not uncommon for the guard to turn against an emperor once they felt that it was time for a change, or if they believed that a newcomer would be better suited to their interests. Soon enough, the Praetorian Guard were about to commit the most heinous act of their 300-year existence. Because Commodus didn't really care about ruling Rome effectively, and because he already had plenty of other enemies to worry about, he made sure to always be on the good side of the Praetorian Guard by granting them a lot of concessions. Pertinax, on the other hand, was a strict and disciplined military man, and intended to reform the Guard by curtailing a lot of its privileges. A plot against him was almost inevitable. In fact, he survived the first one, uncovering a conspiracy to usurp the throne and replace him with a consul named Falco. But afterwards, around 200 to 300 soldiers of the Praetorian Guard simply stormed the palace. They struck Pertinax down, cut off his head, and placed it on a spear, thus ending his reign after 87 days. As word spread throughout Rome of what the Praetorian Guard did to Pertinax, most city officials ran to hide in their homes. One of them, however, immediately saw the opportunity placed in front of him and realized that the throne was up for grabs. That man was a preconsul named Didius Julianus. He made his way to the Praetorian barracks, but wasn't allowed inside the camp and was shocked to discover that somebody else had the same idea as him, the prefect of Rome, Titus Flavius Sulpicianus. As not only the prefect, but also Pertinax's father-in-law, Sulpicianus originally went to the camp to try and smooth over the situation with the Praetorians. This was before Pertinax had been assassinated, but once he learned of the emperor's demise, he thought he might as well make a play for the throne. So he offered the same people who had just murdered his son-in-law a money gift if they would support his ascension as the new emperor. Julianus heard this, and even though he had not been allowed inside the camp, he shouted at the soldiers that he would make them a better offer. Now the Praetorian guard understood the situation in front of them, so they proceeded to start a bidding war between the two officials. But we'll let Cassius Dio tell the story, since he was actually a senator in Rome at the time. Then ensued a most disgraceful business, and one unworthy of Rome. For just as if it had been in some market or auction room, both the city and its entire empire were auctioned off. The sellers were the ones who had slain their emperor, and the would-be buyers were Sopicianus and Julianus, who vied to outbid each other, one from the inside, the other from the outside. They gradually raised their bids up to 20,000 sesterces per soldier. Some of the soldiers would carry word to Julianus, Sulpicianus offers so much, how much more do you make it? And to Sulpicianus in turn, Julianus promises so much, how much do you raise him? In the end, Didius Julianus offered 25,000 sesterces per soldier, which roughly means around $65,000 to $75,000 in modern currency. He also argued that if Sulpicianus were to become emperor, he might attempt to avenge Pertinax's death. This offer was enough to sway the Praetorian Guard, who decided to make Didius Julianus the new emperor of Rome. Later that same night, Julianus rode through the streets of Rome with the guard by his side, weapons out, and standards held high as they made their way to the forum and then to the center. House. This was an intimidation tactic, and it sent a clear message. The Praetorian Guard supported Didius Julianus, and anyone who opposed him would have to deal with them. Going back to Dio's account, who again was a senator at the time, he said there was a genuine fear among his peers. Julianus had called upon them to come to the Senate House and confirm his emperorship, but they were worried that those who had been friends of Pertinax or enemies of Julianus would simply be put to death. Indeed, Cassius Dio was both. He had been granted a praetorship by Pertinax and had also accused Julianus of several offenses. But there was also concern that those who skipped the meeting would simply be hunted down in their homes. So, with a lot of trepidation, the senators made their way to the meeting place, genuinely not knowing if they would be leaving the Senate alive that night. But again, let's hear from the first-hand account of the man who was there. So when bath and dinner were over, we pushed our way through the soldiers, entered the Senate House, and heard him deliver a speech that was quite worthy of him, in the course of which he said, I see that you need a ruler, and I myself am best fitted of any to rule you. I should mention all the advantages I can offer, if you were not already familiar with them, and had not already had experience of me. Consequently, I have not even asked to be attended here by many soldiers, but have come to you alone, in order that you may ratify what has been given to me by them. I am here alone, is what he said, though he had actually surrounded the entire Senate House outside with heavily armed troops and a large number of soldiers in the chamber itself. Moreover, he reminded us of our knowledge of the kind of man he was, in consequence of which we both feared 
had hated him. With no other choice, the Senate confirmed Didius Julianus as the Emperor of Rome, and he went to the palace that night, where he had a feast and celebrated with games and music, while the corpse of his predecessor still lay on the palace floor. The next day, a riot broke out, as the people of Rome firmly rejected Julianus as a legitimate emperor. However, they stood no chance against the Praetorian Guard, and many were slain in the clashes that followed. By buying the loyalty of the Praetorian Guards, Julianus might have had a firm grip on Rome, but the Roman Empire was much bigger than just one city. And the Guard might have been feared by senators and common citizens, but what about an actual army? What about Rome's greatest generals who commanded the loyalty of their soldiers far more than whomever was sitting in the Roman palace? Would they simply roll over and accept Julianus as their new leader, especially after a blatant and shameful ascension that was decried by both politicians and plebeians alike? Well, no, of course not, but this was called the Year of the Five Emperors after all. We've had two so far, so three more were coming. But unlike Pertinax and Julianus, who followed each other in sequence, the other three made a play for the throne at the same time. They were Persenius Niger, Septimius Severus, and Claudius Albinus. They shared similar circumstances. All three were successful, respected Roman generals who were popular with the men under their command. At the time, all of them were serving as governors, Severus in Pannonia, Albinus in Britain, and Persenius in Syria. Once word reached them of what Didius Julianus had done, their men all recognized them as the new emperor and agreed to march on Rome on their behalf. There are three groups that a would-be Roman leader has to contend with. The army, the senate, and the common people. With two out of three, their ascension is pretty much a done deal. Julianus showed us that you can have even just one of them, then get the second one by force and not care about the third. But these three generals all had their own armies, and it's a pretty safe bet that the senate and the people of Rome would have preferred any of them over Didius Julianus. So, which one would win in the end? Gaius Persenius Niger was born circa 135 AD in a small town called Aquinum in provincial Italy. He came from more modest means compared to his rivals and was part of an equestrian family. We don't know much about his early career, but his military record allowed him to rise above his station, eventually becoming the first member of his family to become a senator under Commodus. After several governorships and consulships throughout the empire, Persenius ended up in Syria in 191 AD. By all accounts, he was well liked by the people in Syria and by the senators back in Rome. In terms of military support, pretty much the entire Middle Eastern section of the empire was behind him – Syria, Egypt, Jerusalem, Arabia, and Cappadocia. If the Romans had it their way, it would seem that they would have probably wanted Persenius to be their new emperor. According to Dio, it was his name that the citizens shouted and praised whenever Julianus was out in public. Unfortunately for them, Persenius was the furthest one of all, stationed at the eastern edge of the Roman Empire. The closest one was Septimius Severus, who was in Pannonia. This was a Roman province right next to Italy. Born in Africa in 145 AD in the ancient port city of Leptis Magna, Severus was the son of a Roman mother and a Carthaginian father. He first traveled to Rome when he was 18 and began working his way up through the ranks of the Roman public office, which was also referred to as the Cursus Honorum. This culminated in 191 AD with the governorship of Upper Pannonia, also under Commodus. Dio described Severus as the shrewdest of the four men fighting for the throne. As soon as he heard of the death of Pertinax, he made preparations to go to Rome and become the new emperor. He had the support of most of the soldiers in Central and Eastern Europe, while those in Britain, Gaul, and the Iberian Peninsula were behind Claudius Albinus. Speaking of whom, our last contender was born circa 147 AD, possibly in the African city of Hadrumetum, located in modern-day Tunisia. We say possibly because the main source of Albinus's early life is History Augusta, which is notoriously unreliable. Like the other two, Albinus was made a governor by Commodus. Back to Septimius Severus. Because he was stationed close to Italy, he was the first to make his way towards Rome. A calculating man, Severus realized that even if he did not take the throne, he would immediately have two powerful rivals to contend with. Neither of the other two were likely to give up their claim just because Didius Julianus was no longer emperor. Therefore, he sought out a pact with Albinus, and he sent a letter where Severus agreed to recognize him as Caesar if he were to remain in Britain. We're not sure exactly if this meant that the two would rule together, or if Severus offered to appoint the other governor as his heir, but this was good enough for Albinus, who stayed put, at least for now. 
As far as Julianus was concerned, he offered little resistance to Septimius Severus. First, he tried to send prefects and ambassadors to him, either to delay his advance or to persuade his men to abandon him. However, the opposite happened, and more of them ended up siding with Severus. The general then captured Ravenna and its fleet without a fight, as most of the populace he encountered preferred him over Julianus. According to Dio, there was one battle between the Praetorians and Severus's forces, but the Praetorians were absolutely crushed and did nothing worthy of their name and of their promise. The historian thinks that this was because the Praetorians had become too complacent or had learned to live delicately, as he put it. They were fine when they threatened old senators or went up against citizens armed with rocks, but got demolished by an actual battle-hardened army. Other sources say the battle was not even necessary as the Praetorians abandoned Julianus en masse as Severus advanced. In a desperate attempt, Julianus went to the Senate and asked them to talk to Severus so that the two of them could rule together. Of course, it was far too late for such offers. Once Severus sent word to Rome that he would spare the Praetorians as long as they surrendered the ones who assassinated Pertinax, his fate was sealed. The guards arrested Julianus and turned him over to the Senate. He was then sentenced to death. Septimius Severus was proclaimed the new emperor, and Pertinax was deified. Didius Julianus was executed on the 1st of June 193 AD after just 66 days as emperor. He is barely remembered today, but what he did was almost impressive in a way, as he managed to become as hated by the Romans, if not more so, as notorious emperors like Caligula or Nero, and he did it in just two months. Septimius Severus was the new ruler of the Roman Empire, but he still had a few threats to deal with. For starters, the Praetorians. Clearly, they could not be trusted. He might have promised to spare their lives, but that did not mean he couldn't punish them. He summoned them all, and after chastising them for their actions against Pertinax, he confiscated their arms and horses and banished them all from Rome. Now on to the more serious threat, Persenius, who clearly had no intention of giving up his claim to the throne. Fortunately for Severus, he also had the weaker army, and according to Dio, the weaker mind. He was getting too cocky and more puffed up than ever, as the historian put it, and hearing all this stuff about the people chanting his name in the streets of Rome and his own soldiers referring to him as the new Alexander went to his head. He was certain of victory, but was about to have a very rude awakening. Persenius set up headquarters in Byzantium, a city deeply loyal to him. From there, he marched his army and met Severus in battle for the first time that year at the city of Cyzixus. Not only was he defeated, but one of his most trusted generals, Aemilianus, was slain. Not surprisingly, Severus kept the pressure on after his victory and laid siege on Byzantium, forcing him to retreat further east into Nicaea. Another battle took place there in December, and it resulted in another triumph for Septimius Severus. Persenius's imperial dreams were starting to shatter. Not only did he suffer multiple defeats, but he was beginning to lose support as some provinces, like Egypt and Arabia, switched their allegiances to Severus. One final push was all it would take to finally break him. It didn't happen until 193, but it did occur the following year at Issus during one last major battle between the two sides. Persenius not only lost again, but was captured by the enemy during his retreat. He was beheaded, and then Severus sent his head on a pole to Byzantium, which was still under siege in an effort to get them to finally abandon their loyalty to him. It actually took two more years before Byzantium fell, but once that happened, Severus's position was secured. There was just one problem left, Claudius Albinius, the last remaining pretender to the throne. He was proclaimed emperor at the same time as Severus, but the two of them forged a tenuous alliance, with Albinus accepting the title of Caesar and ruling over most western parts of the empire while Severus was dealing with Persenius and Byzantium. But Albinus was fully expecting to one day become emperor should Severus die before him, but the latter had no intention of allowing this to happen and probably never did. Severus had two sons and he wanted them to follow him as emperor, not Albinus. First, Severus tried using trickery and sent assassins to Albinus under the guise of messengers. They failed, however, and now there was no choice but open combat between them. Albinus began mobilizing his troops in Britain and proclaimed himself sole emperor, while Severus did the same, except that he named his eldest son as his co-emperor. In late 196 AD, Albinus and his forces crossed into Gaul, and he fought Severus on February 19, 197 AD, at the Battle of Lugdunum, modern-day Lyon, in France. This would have been a massive conflict for the time, as Dio mentions that each side had 150,000 soldiers. The tide turned several times as neither one dominated the field of battle, but ultimately Septimius Severus was triumphant once more. Albinus retreated to Lugdunum, but once the war was lost, he killed himself. Severus took his head and sent it to Rome, making it clear that he finally reigned supreme.
With all the other contenders out of the way, there was nobody left to challenge the authority of Septimius Severus. It might have technically lasted over four years, but the year of five emperors was finally over and the Severan dynasty could begin. First came a show of dominance as Severus looked to punish all of those who showed support to his enemies, particularly in the eastern parts of the empire, which had aligned themselves with Pisenius. There were executions, there were exiles, and there was a lot of confiscation of property. After all, Severus had grand ambitions of conquest, and those don't come cheap. His first military campaign took place in 197 AD against Parthia, like many Roman emperors before him. He was moderately successful and captured some territory, but in the end, despite two long sieges, he failed to conquer the fortified city of Hatra, just like Trajan had failed almost a century prior. His other main military campaign was in Britain, in 208 AD, where he intended to conquer Caledonia, which roughly corresponds to Scotland nowadays. His initial foray was successful, even though it came with heavy casualties, as the Caledonians refused to engage in open in combat and kept utilizing guerrilla warfare. By 210 AD, the enemy had been defeated and left no choice but to sue for peace, but the terms were so one-sided that they rebelled just a few months later. Severus prepared for a second incursion, this one with the intent of wiping out the Caledonians completely. His orders were, let no one escape sheer destruction, no one our hands, not even the babe in the womb of the mother, if it be male, let it nevertheless not escape sheer destruction. He did not live to see his orders carried out though, Severus was already sick and stricken with gout and arthritis. He fell ill during the campaign, and feeling it was the end, he retreated to Aboricum, or York as we call it today, and died on the 4th of February, 211 AD. Before his demise, Severus had made his younger son Gerter a co-emperor as well, with hopes that he would reign alongside his older brother. This would not come to pass, however, as his eldest would go on to become one of the cruelest tyrants to ever sit on the Roman throne, but we will explore that story another day when we take a look at the reign of Caracalla. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.